just before I start, like, yeah, so just uh, our relationship from Lead Feeder with Vendep, like, uh, they, they are one of our investors. And uh, since joining with Lead Feeder, I've been working very closely with you, but like, we speak on a monthly basis on our board meetings. And um, that's once per month, and it's typically uh, go on for a few hours. But, um, and uh, I think like, this is the first company that I've been working with that's got such a close relationship with, with, the, with the external investors in that we, we, as a leadership team, are able to speak with our investors on a monthly basis, which has been super helpful. Um, and also, I think from, a, from their perspective, it also gives them like a really good feel for how the business is being run and so on. I'm just speaking on your behalf there, Yupa, but I, No, absolutely, absolutely. So, yeah. Okay, well, look, let's, um, let's get right into it. As Yupa said, like if there are any questions, please just, uh, just drop into Q&A. I also have a, the Q&A window open here myself as well, so I'll be able to see like uh, what's happening, but Yupa will, uh, will interrupt me if needs be. Also see like a number of people writing in the chat as well. Like welcome to everybody, by the way, we have like a, a lot of people on, which is really great to see, but let's, uh, let's get right into it. So, so what's my focus here is this obviously focusing on um, building a marketing engine, which is, which is focused on revenue. But like, I'm going to show you how we did that at lead feeder. And of course, like throughout this, just remember that this is going to be like a, a little bit different for everybody based on your business model, based on your deal sizes and so on. I've, I've done it for two different types of business, lead feeder being a volume business with lower account um, uh, order values. And then my previous organizations prior to lead feeder where I learned how to do this mostly was with larger deal sizes, so enterprise deal sizes, so much longer sales cycles, so minimum sort of six to nine month sales cycles, minimums of 100K um, per year contracts and so on. But I'll get into that now in a few minutes. So my background, just um, an FYI, I started at Lead Feeder in November 2019, or just towards the end of 20 or yeah, 2019. Um, and prior to that, I was uh, the VP of marketing over at Exponia, which was a very, very fast growing startup. One of the fa I believe the fastest growing startup in Europe in 2018. Um, and uh, then grew, was continued to grow very quickly during the time I was there. One of their core issues back then was that they weren't able to generate leads or they didn't know how to generate leads. My previous experience had been basically focused purely on lead gen over to Marsis, which is a much larger, larger organization when I was there. We had uh, annual revenues of sort of between 70, to, I think the, what the time I was there, we grew from 70 million to around 90 million ARR. And when I joined Exponia, it was more sort of 4.5 million. So much smaller, but a bigger opportunity to grow the team there and grow how we were doing the business. So um, at Exponia, I, I, I took over a mix about the marketing org and then eventually the SDR team as well, which was part of the, um, which was part of the sales organization, but I decided to bring it in under the marketing org and then owned the majority of the pipeline generation for the organization then, which was roughly about 12 million per quarter. Um, the time I was there, we seen sort of like a 200% year on year growth, like because of the, the size of the business and the size of the business, the deals that we were, that we were bringing in. Um, we were able to see that that type of acceleration early on. Obviously, that doesn't continue that 200% growth, but it was super interesting to see how we could grow the organization from a headcount perspective. When I first joined, it was sort of 60 people. And uh, when I was leaving there, it was about 330. And that was in the space of, of just under two years. So, uh, and then it was also the same from a, a revenue generation perspective. Also quite interesting. But then uh, Amaris is prior to that, which has just been acquired by SAP. Um, uh, much much larger business, a couple of thousands of employees, but that's where I really learned how to build these revenue teams uh, from the marketing. And um, so, like my, I think it's important to start off with my philosophy and also like why that why I have that philosophy is marketing and sales should really be one in one. Um, and I know that's that's clear and everybody says it, but I don't. I think, well, the numbers also show that not everybody's doing it. Um, and I think with a lot of people here that are probably from. Uh, maybe startup stage or like smaller revenue stages. Um, I think it's important when you're looking for somebody in marketing or somebody to run your marketing, the, the typical answer to that question that I normally give is that you should focus on somebody that maybe has some sales, sales experience. And my career started as an SDR and account management. Although I did study marketing, I went then into the sales route because there was more money in it. But then um, eventually I wanted to go back into marketing and that's how I ended up where I am today. But I think that experience earlier on in the sales side helped me understand the plight of the salesperson, understand, okay, what's the, what's the easiest way for me as a marketer to help? 
So I think this is typical across a lot of organizations and it's, it's every organization that I've gone into has had some level of this. With Lead Feeder, it hasn't been as bad, but there were some, there were some signals there that there was misalignment between marketing and sales. But in the two previous organizations I was working with, there was no communication between the marketing and sales org, um, which basically puts both of them in the dark somewhat. So marketing aren't able to help sales in the way that they'd like, or they're not able to provide back the value that they could potentially offer back. Um, and at the same time, sales are normally giving out that marketing are providing them with stuff that just is below par. Like one of the things that you'll normally hear from sales orgs is, hey, uh, the leads that the marketing team are giving us are shit. That's a typical complaint from sales. Excuse my French, of course, but it's, it's a very typical complaint. And I think the more closer that sales and marketing get together, the less likely you are to get that complaint. And that's, there's many reasons for that complaint, not just the quality of the leads, but also perceptions of what quality looks like for both teams. A um, couple of reasons why we should care about that. So apologize for my handwriting here, <laughs> but it's, <laughs> I think it's, the numbers are clear. So the reasons why we should be aligned between sales and marketing is 209% more revenue from marketing, which is obviously something that we want to be focused on. Um, and then the win rates are much, much higher. So 38% higher win rates for those teams that are aligned between sales and marketing, right? And if you look at this slide, Gartner did a study in the past year or so that looked at uh, thousands of companies, I believe in the tech space, that uh, claimed that their sales and marketing outfits were well aligned, but actually only 8% of those companies actually were. So that means out of a hundred companies, only eight of those teams are actually aligned. So if you're thinking about you and your competitors and you look at those figures from before the 209% and the 38% or whatever it was, like if you're, if, if you're managing to align yourself between your sales and marketing org, but in your org, then you're probably ahead of your competition because typically people aren't. And I'll get into later on, like what does that look like? But um, it's, uh, it's pretty daunting. Okay, so I've just been through some of the um, like the theory behind it and some of the numbers and so on, but how is that applied to Lead Feeder in terms of what I've done since I've joined Lead Feeder? Okay, and that's probably the main reason why most of you guys are tuning in here because you want some actionable information and things that you guys can actually do. So if we look at this slide here, this is um, I've I've blanked out all numbers throughout this, so <laughs> just just an FYI, there's going to be some areas where I've got X's in instead of instead of numbers, and I've just blanked out the numbers here. But this this slide shows the increase um, across across time in, in terms of overall signups to Lead Feeder. So just to explain from for people that aren't familiar with Lead Feeder, um, we recognize the companies which are visiting your website. Um, and we give you where those people have come from, how long they've been on the site for, et cetera, what they've been looking at. But we offer a 14 day free trial, okay? And that's typically like uh, where most of our focus is from a marketing org is getting more free trials on. And as you can see here, like if we look over time, we can see nice growth there. Of course, like in December, uh, you expect a little bit of a drop because it's a shorter month because of Christmas, but then January looking very, very solid. So that's January, 2020, where we're seeing a massive jump in signups to free trials, which is really great, right? Until you start asking a few questions, okay? So I, I started, you know, I, I was trying to learn the business, understand the business a bit better and seeing that our, our, like our Northern star was, was focused on signups. So trial signups. How many signups can we get in through the door? Um, and, uh, you know, the more that we get in, the more business is going to be spat out down the bottom, right? That, it's clear math there. Um, but the question that I started asking is, okay, what have we been doing in order to scale these signups? So what's the main action that the marketing team have been doing? Because as you look back, if I go back to the last slide, it's, it's scaling quite quickly. So what's changed? So the main thing that's changed was in spend, right? So the it was, it was a focus on, Let's get as many signups as we can and let's focus on building that, which in that particular moment in time was, was the good move because signups were low. They needed to get more signups in through the door. The easiest way to do that is to, is to pay for more. Um, but then the next question after that for me was really, if we have that amount of signups, uh, like how many of those are actually turning into revenue? Okay. Now, my apologies to hear my four-year-old singing in the background, <laughs> the joys of the joys of remote working. Um, but how many of those signups are actually turning into revenue is was it was a question that a lot of people found difficult to answer and that to me was a was a bit of a warning sign so if we're bringing these in do we know what we're actually getting back 
Um, and if we look at like, this is, this is a slide that I presented to the board, I think in, in February of last year. So two months after I joined, some of the, the, the points on this slide were, you know, after we had recognized, Hey, we have a bit of a, a, a little bit of an issue in terms of how much money we're spending on a monthly basis in, in, in comparison to what we're getting back. I think if we look at the stuff that's in red here, first and foremost, okay. Uh, like these are clear, these were clear warning signs that hey we're probably not focused on the right things we need to be we need to be we need to put a little bit of effort in there now in order to bring these numbers down so let's look at payback period okay so from our our paid ads that we were doing mostly on google we were spending a ton of cash on google we could see that like just the payback period alone from the program cost so that's before taking any full-time headcount into it, into or full-time employees into it, into consideration. We had like an 18.4 month payback period and our target there was about 12 months. So we wanted it to be about 12 months. So I was like, okay, that's, that's far too high. Um, and then in terms of where we were, what we were bringing in from a revenue perspective, the premiums that I have down here, a number which was super difficult to get our hands on, by the way, it took a month or so to try to get our hands on this information. Um, also didn't appear to me, obviously based on the payback period, to not be that great. And then I'm looking, I, if I look at the top of the funnel, I look up here like total signups. I'm like, okay, that's looking pretty solid. Cost per signup, it's fine. You know, it's, it's not too bad. If I look at what we were calling marketing qualified leads, and this is something I'll get to a little bit later on, marketing qualified leads to me is like a less qualified uh, or, or something that maybe might turn into business, right? It's not a true indicator of, success for me or, or something that's going to turn into business. There was an additional uh, area that we were looking at was inbound leads that were coming in. We were assigning them to salespeople, right? If they didn't go over a certain size, then they weren't assigned. They were left in the app to convert themselves. But if it was assigned, that to me was more of like a push in the direction to say, this is something that's probably more likely to turn into business because it's been left on a salesperson's desk to follow up with, right? Now, not all MQLs were being left on, on, on the salesperson's desk either. Some of those also went into the no-touch pool. So like for me, it was a bit muddy, this MQL piece here. Um, and when I was looking at the figures here, like I was like, okay, that doesn't look about right. So I was starting here, right? And then like dipping down a little bit down towards the funnel and being like, hmm, that doesn't seem too good. And then I was looking at, okay, when we're looking at where the actual money is made, typically is in here, I'm looking, okay, that's probably not great. And then we started digging even further. And then we seen that our payback period were way too, way too high. Okay. So what did we do then? This is in January, in February, like by mid January, we're like, okay, like we need to, we need to look into this. And as we started to look into it, we started saying, okay, there is a lot of stuff that we're doing that's not being profitable. So what we started to do then was like start to, to cut back on the paid uh, on the paid spend, as you can see here, minus 46% on paid. Our total sign up started to go down. The, the cost per sign up also went down, obviously, because we cut our, cut our budgets. But if we look at the, the number of MQLs, these marketing qualified leads that we spoke about before, actually went up slightly. And so did the actual inbound assign. So what we started to do was double down on the campaigns that were working and take money away from the ones that weren't, right? And our costs then, as you see, start to go down. And then our payback period for those as well start to go down as well. So actually what we started to see was it's right within a month after making all of these changes, we started to see, okay, look, our payback periods are going down. We're starting to be profitable. But we wouldn't have been able to do any of that work without looking at the revenue. So starting up here and then joining the dots all the way down to the bottom. And I'm not saying that's an easy thing to do. It's a difficult thing to do, but it's something that every marketing team should be trying to do. Okay, so how did we then look further into what being profitable, what isn't being profitable with our data, right? So like we pride ourselves on our data. Not every company has that level, layer of data, but what I would say to you is track everything you possibly can, okay? We have a, we have a biz ops team here at Leadfeeder who are excellent in terms of where we keep our data and how to structure that data, how to get meaning out of that data. So we use a mix of a couple of data warehouses, segment, Plus, uh, um, plus Tableau as a, as a means by which we can, we can crunch the data and actually see trends there. But what we started asking our, our, our biz ops team was like, okay, show us all of the different campaigns that we're running from Google mainly, right? We want to see all of our different marketing channels and then be able to click in to understand what's working, what isn't working based per campaign, right? So like, let's look at paid search here. And when I click on paid search, 
what it brought me up here is a couple of different, uh, all of our different campaigns that we're running that we're bringing in signups and assigned signups. Assigned, as I mentioned before, is given over to a salesperson. And, and what we started to see was, okay, like if I focus on these four, right? Um, these ones were driving quite a few signups. Again, I've taken out the numbers, um, but these were driving quite a high volume of signups, right? And if I look at the assigned number, so let's take this, this third one here, EU prospecting. 40% of those that were, that were coming in were being assigned, but only 3.3% of those were actually turning into business, right? So what we started to clearly see was like, hey, some of these campaigns that we're running, whether it's on a first click model or a, or a last click model, I'm sure people will have questions about attribution models and so on, which I'll happily answer at the end. Um, you can see that like these just weren't being profitable. So what did we do? We just turned them off, right? It was, it was, it was actually a pretty simple thing to make a decision on, but we had to have the data to prove it, right? And if we look at this over time, like you can see, this is another slide that I that that you've has seen already as well in one of our board meetings. But if we look at this, how this changed over time, so we started to make the changes here. And again, it's a focus on revenue. It's not a focus on like how much can we throw in at the top of the funnel, but a more like, okay, if we're spending this, what are we getting back, right? What we started to see our payback period go down. So in Q3, like Q1 2020, we had a payback period of 21 months as an average because of that really high January. Um, but then what we started to do is in Q2 and Q3, we started to drop downwards and downwards and downwards. So uh, over the space of the year, we dropped our spend by 41%. Our ARR went up 24% and the payback period dropped by 52%, right? Now, these all look great, right? Don't get me wrong. It brings in other challenges, challenges being like, okay, like if these campaigns aren't performing, how do we create new ones that will start performing? And when you create that revenue focus, it's very hard to, to focus on testing and how long do you test for until you start seeing revenue and so on. But, uh, but like based on this, this helped us like take money away from, from where we would have been spending on, on paid and then start to put it into other areas of the business, which a sort of plan of mine was to come in with more organic growth. So like on content, let's call it free versus paid. The free stuff being on content, paid stuff, taking a little bit of budget back from there and then handing it over over to the, the free stuff, right? But if we look at like this, this particular type of strategy was accelerated, okay? And it accelerated around this time. So everybody on the call here today will be familiar what happened around that time. So we, we went into a global pandemic and, and everybody was sort of in the same boat being like, okay, well, what do we do with this? Like, how do we, how do we act? Like, what, what's the next move we should make? And it was a lot of people just sat back a little bit, but like, I'll get into what we did uh, now in just the next couple of minutes. But it really, this, this actually COVID helped us accelerate that strategy of being a content first strategy and then pulling money away from the paid piece and then putting it into the, into the content piece. But I'll get to that now in a sec. So I headed first react. It's actually really funny. It just started with a couple of text messages between myself and a gentleman named Alex Ollie, who's, uh, who's the CEO and co-founder of a company called Reach Desk, who's a direct mail company based out of the UK. And we had done some webinar together back in December of 2019. And then we just said, hey, look, maybe we should do another webinar. And that was, that was March 14th. So we were like, I, I was like, look, we should probably try to do something um, and not just sit on our hands. Let's try to do something and push forward with something. And uh, Alex was like, okay, let's, let's just do it. And as you can see, he was trying to get out of, out of New York at the time. He was stuck there. And uh, when I was texting him, that was on a Saturday, March 14th. And then uh, like we said, okay, let's talk on Monday. And that was the last we, we spoke over that weekend. But then uh, with the team, I just wanted to make sure that everybody was aligned because I knew what we needed to do was have some form of reaction and start to really you know, push things. But I wanted to make sure that everybody was doing okay. We were a small tight knit team. Um, there was like six or seven of us. I'll get to the team now in a minute in terms of who was on the team and what those roles were. But um, Following that, then it was like, okay, spoke with Alex on the Monday. Let's get a webinar out. Johnny organized a webinar. He was my head of demand gen. Then five hours later, we're looking at 233 registrations. It started to like build this sort of like, uh, like motivation within the team internally with the sales team, marketing team, everybody just sort of being like, okay, this is, this is great. Let's keep pushing forward. Right. Um, and uh, a bit of excitement within the organization. A day later, we're at like 430 registrants. This is the day before the webinar took place. And then the day of 650 registrants with, with uh, 250 people coming into the room, it was actually maxed out. We had it 
11 or 250, more than 250 tried to get in. So <laughs> there you go. But with that, what we started to see was like, we, we started, it, for me, it was a clear indication that we should start taking money away from just like trying to get as much in at the top of the funnel um, by paying for it and try to sort of move to almost like a, a demand gen perspective, but a sort of free demand gen perspective. Let's come up with content which is resonating with the database, but let's not like try to get them bought into the product like immediately, okay? So what we started to do is like take away, as I said before, this sort of focus on paid and make sure that that's all running nice and smoothly and make sure it's being profitable was at the same time investing in the areas which we think are, you know, are, or investing in the area which I, which I knew was going to be performing better, which was the content side, okay? So based off of that, we just started to roll out these webinars week on week, right? And over the space of six months, We'd, or seven months or whatever it was, we managed to get up to like 15,000 registrants for these things. We spent no money. We spent a grand or something, right? But I think the most important thing to get out of this, and especially if you're in a smaller organization, is that like we focused on things like just getting stuff executed, okay? Like I can't like describe to you enough like how important this is because what I see with a lot of marketing teams is that they they plan a lot and then they don't actually get around to executing those plans because they're in a fast paced industry and things just move on, right? And they spend all their time planning and you can find yourself doing plans about, about plans and the plan when I'm gonna release the plan instead of just going ahead and executing. And that's something that I, that I briefed the team on. I'll, I'll get to that now in a minute. It's a lot of work. It was hard, right? But it's, it's something that has to be done, right? <laughs> um, and then the second part was, was around finding what, what actually drives revenue. So what is the like the, the real Northern star? As I said to you before, like we were focused on top of funnel signups when I first joined. And then she started to dig into the funnel a little bit more. You started to see, okay, things just really don't look to be right here. And I'll get into what we focus on nowadays now in a moment. But let's look at this execution piece. So just uh, actually just in the chat real quick, um, I've heard this quite a bit from founders in that um, their market, they hear from the market that they don't have the resource to execute X, Y, or Z. Now, if you've got a small marketing team, a couple of people, whatever, I'd be interested to hear um, if, if, like, if you hear often that your, sale, that your marketing team don't have the resource to do, let's say, eBooks. Anything in the chat? Don't see anything there. Not yet. Always. Okay. I'm seeing, yeah, I'm seeing this. Yeah. Yeah. It's every, I think every single fan, I think Christian, maybe we spoke before even, I believe this is a, this is something that, um, that I see quite a bit from, from founders that marketing, we need more resource. Okay. Um, there, yeah, I think, I think it's, I think it's a core issue. Okay. And I think it's, um, it's, it's, it's a problem within marketing across, across the globe, in my opinion. And it, uh, there's, there's a, Budget as well. Budget, <laughs> budget's another thing. Um, we'll talk about how to involve more people to create content in a moment, Sammy. But um, like, if I look at my team, this is what the team looked like um, when I first joined. So this this was the the size of the marketing org and the different roles that we had on the marketing org. So uh, I had a a head of content. Um, at the time we were, so it's funny that Sammy just mentions in here about experience with outsourcing content creation. I agree with you. Um, when I say outsourced here, I'll get to that now in a moment, but we did work together with a, an agency that were charging us about, I think it was about 12 K a month for them to produce content. Okay. Uh, was at the same time having a head of content and SEO that like came with a lot of experience and also not cheap. Right. So I, when I first came out, I was like, why are we working with these people? Are they, are they driving, they're, they're driving good signups. And I was like, okay, at the time I can understand why that was put in, right? Um, like, uh, but what I started to ask, okay, why isn't our head of content the one to drive our content strategy? Somebody that's actually in the company themselves, okay? Um, so like, I, for, for me, it was like, okay, let's, let's get rid of that marketing agency or that, that SEO agency put our trust in our head of content and have that head of content then start to work with external writers that are 
doing most of their work for Lead Feeder, but they're not actually full-time employees. And that's something that worked really, really, really well. Um, we had a product marketing manager that sort of finished up with us around August of last year, and we're still trying to fill that role. Um, we have somebody that's managing our website, demand gen manager that was uh, focused on things like the webinars, getting those out, making sure that we have downloadable content on the website, et cetera, et cetera. And then a growth manager who's looking after all of our paid stuff, okay? So like the, the team is not enormous. I'm aware that there will be some people on the call today that may only have one or two or no marketing people. If you're asking my opinion on where to start here, I would start somewhere around the demand gen or the paid um, and then have some level of content in there. So if you have somebody from demand gen, have them focused on something from a content perspective, right? But we can get into that a little bit later. Um, so what I started to say, was, okay, let's just get content out, okay? So I, I asked this question at the start in terms of, hey, um, about resource for the marketing team. Why aren't they releasing content? Why aren't eBooks coming out? Why aren't videos being made? And it's typically because they, they don't really trust themselves to push out things. And Christian, with the, with the monthly budget, uh, that's actually something you can work with. 12K is, is not, a, I would say, a terrible monthly budget from a marketing perspective. But from content creation, it doesn't necessarily have to cost you anything more than what you're already paying somebody if they have somebody in marketing. And I'll get to that in a sec, but get everybody involved in content creation. So we had, uh, like I started getting people, okay, uh, our marketing team reacted in a certain way to COVID. Let's get them all of those. That's the company budget. Okay, that's a, that's a, that's a, that's a, that's a thing for another day, Christian, I think. Maybe we, can, maybe we can catch up on LinkedIn after this. But what we were... Um, what we were doing is getting everybody involved in the content creation. For example, the, our reaction to COVID was a super interesting story, which I thought other marketing teams might want to know, right? And uh, they, so, so what we started to do was start to, um, start to create content like that. So I got our marketing team together. We did a webinar and we got like 500 people on that wanted to listen how Lead Feeder attacked uh, the, the COVID situation, right? And what we did to react. Um, and again, that didn't cost us anything. It was just using the resource that we already had. Okay. Um, another mistake that a lot of people make when it comes to content is creating content that they probably wouldn't read themselves. So it was like, for me, I, thought, I also see this coming a lot from founders as well as, hey, we need to create more content, which is closer tied to our product. Okay. There is a place for that. It's typically in video content, but if you're creating things like eBooks, uh, webinars, et cetera, like my experience is that you're going to have a hard time driving an audience or driving eyeballs onto something that's very, very product focused from your perspective like people don't want to pitch they want value but not a pitch okay typically what we would do is offer something tangible so what we'd always say for our webinars for example or our ebooks it'd always be something that people could take away for free and actually go implement okay and it's it can it doesn't need to be something massive but it, it can be something that people are able to actually do something with and that was always the feedback they were like wow like lead feeder have been able to offer us tangible advice on when or what to do in this particular situation Right. Um, and uh, it's 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 you know, it's it's worked quite nicely. And then when you actually get to the stage where people are actually in the in the in the uh, in the market for a product like yours, they um, they then uh, are able to uh, they, they then have you top of mind because you're able to offer value before. And every time I'd say let's offer value rather than look pretty so that we can move quickly. OK, um, I see one question come in here from Kai. Have you set out KPIs for all of those roles in marketing org? If so, it would be interesting to hear a bit more about those or is everyone measured on number of MQLs you bring in? So Kai, actually we've got a, a very, uh, I don't want to say complex model, but we've got a very uh, detailed like a KPI sheet, which is based off a number of areas. I call one of, one of the main areas is, or the, for, the core focus is on revenue. And then it's based down from sales qualified leads, which I'll get to now in a moment. And then the levers towards what actually drives sales qualified leads. Then different teams within marketing are then focused on those different levers towards bringing in more sales qualified leads. So uh, some of that would be bringing in overall signups at the top of the funnel, right? That would be one specific team, which is now currently under my growth team. Then there would be somebody that would be focused mainly on MQL. So an MQL to us now is somebody that hasn't signed up for a trial. That would be the demand gen team. So, so like a lead generation team. And um, then the content team is obviously based around traffic. So 
they're, they're driving traffic to the site based on the content that they're creating or that they're creating. Um, and then also everybody is focused on the SQL piece as well. So based on the channel that you're particularly running. So let's say our blog, for example, under Anna, who's my head of content, she'd be also focused on, on our sales qualified leads, which we know lead to revenue, but our core focus would be on traffic. So it's like a little bit of a mix, main focus, revenue and sales qualified leads was then root, uh, go towards revenue and then below that then the specific area of focus hope that makes sense so like if we look at this this is just like examples of some of the stuff that we executed but like when i say to you it's it's not actually that hard to get your marketing team if you have one to start executing things because i came from a, a different role before i came into lead feeder whereby it was uh, I, I, had a, I had a large team that were able to do a lot of the execution themselves. Then I came to lead feeder, a very small team that hadn't done a huge amount of execution before themselves. So I had no choice but to start executing myself. So I just like picked my own brain, came up with a couple of eBooks. I was like, okay, well, what's going to start working? Account-based uh, account marketing, for example. I wrote that, turning teams into revenue machines. I wrote that based on this, what I'm presenting here. We started doing webinars. We started doing like a, like um, sort of um, like interviews with like people that were in my network, other people's network. And we just started building out stuff that way. And it didn't cost us anything apart from the cost that we had of people that were already there, right? That's what I'm getting at. But I think um, marketing teams, and I'm probably, if there are other marketers on here, I'm probably not going to be very popular. But uh, I think like marketers tend not to do enough execution themselves. And I think if, if you allow them, for founders as well, if you allow them to do some execution and just test things, push some stuff out, you'll start to see that like people will start to start to react pretty nicely. It doesn't happen overnight, but I think there's a lot of knowledge if you're hiring anyway, there's definitely a lot of knowledge in marketers. There's also a lot of knowledge within the organization that marketing would be able to pull knowledge out of. And just start creating content. It's not, it's not like massively difficult. Some of these things took us two or three days to put together, right? And it actually started building over time. And like if you look at this one up in the top corner here, we just we just finished doing an ebook with uh with like a, a lot of video providers. And uh I, I was actually shocked at how we managed to get this together because all of those providers are, are competitors of one another, but we managed to get three different competitors to talk to one another and to, to, to collaborate in content and also send it out to their databases. So um, yeah, like I, I think it, it's about building over time. It's not gonna happen overnight, but I think that focus on content and focus on content, which will resonate is really important. But um, like, as we've seen, like what does this lead to? It's lead to very nice traffic growth throughout the entire year of 2020. We rode the, the COVID algorithm update um, in Google as well by creating COVID related content based on our core user. A simple example, one of our core, our main core user is sales. We created email templates to help SDRs during COVID, for example, which drove a ton of traffic, right? And it's just about like using common sense in that respect to really, you know, what are the things that are going to resonate right now with the people that I should be reading my content? And it worked. Um, second part is keeping revenue forever in your site. So as I said to you before, like that marketing qualified lead thing is not a solid enough um, indicator of, of revenue for me or things that are going to turn into revenue, which is why we came up with new um, definitions and, and, and new um, new layers within the funnel. We created the sales qualified lead. And the sales qualified lead to me was really uh, like the number one focus on quality, right? There was no, like the MQL was too, uh, and, and sales qualified lead was like sales were excited to get more sales qualified leads into their, into their queue, right? It means that maybe less are going through, but out of that less, we know that they're more likely to turn into revenue. And I'll get to that now in a moment in terms of how we know that. But we've started to focus on that. That paired together with the average revenue per account that we're bringing in for those sales qualified leads has helped us set our targets very nicely. So we can see like over time, our average revenue per account is rising, right? Whilst at the same time, our, um, our SQLs are rising, right? We've had this is December because of Christmas, went down a little bit in the US in November because of Thanksgiving and uh, general election. Um, January is going to be a bit above this particular month here. So January will probably be our best month that we've had. But it's like hey, steady growth month by month. Andy, 
Let's go. Yeah. Yeah. A quick, quick one here. Uh, um, can you tell me, tell us a little bit more about how you score those leads? How do they move? Why do they move from uh, MQL to SQL? Do you do like uh, some scoring, or or how you do that? And and what do you recommend? And then secondly, uh, don't don't forget uh, people to put those questions in Q and A, so we can have some more good ones at the end of this session. Sure. So like uh, just on that. So so yeah. So what we started to do was we. Um, we recognize the regions in which we like our, our core regions in which we sell into. They're the like the with there's like a couple of layers of qualification there. Plus, like so core region, uh, how big their sales team is, which is normally an indica indication of, of quality, plus uh, has a phone number that we're able to reach out to, plus um, it has a certain number of uh, leads that we recognize, like based on a traffic number that they have coming to their site. Right. So after they install our tracking script, which is also the most important thing, have they installed the tracking script? They haven't installed the tracking script. They'll never become an SQL. Then after they install the tracking script, there's a minimum lead count as well as like a regional uh, lookup, as well as some other uh, bits of bits of data there as well, which we know are more likely to turn into business. Does that answer that question? Okay, Yupa. Oops. Yes, it did. Thank you. Perfect. Okay. So uh, like they were our, our core like uh, indicators of, of growth there. Um, so uh, so like I uh, just see one question come in there. Um, why or how is SQL growth is, is SQL growth correlated to the ARPA growth? So there are a couple of things. Um, in, in terms of uh, the targeting that we've been doing, targeting larger accounts, so, or accounts that have more traffic. So the, for, in our case, the more traffic that's, that's on somebody's account, the more leads we recognize and therefore our price is gonna go up. Okay, so there's that side of things. On top of that, in coming into this year, we've also done um, a small price increase as well for, for new clients, which we do typically do on a yearly basis. Plus there's been some updates to the product which help recognize more leads. So there's actually a lot of different things that are, that are coming into effect here from the marketing team in terms of what we can most influence is the, the size of accounts that we're targeting, right? So if there's a certain messaging that's correlating uh, with, um, I just seen another question come in there. If there's a certain messaging that's correlating or resonating with a certain audience, um, for example, it's bringing in too low of ARPAs, we're, we're focusing on too small of accounts then we know we need to we need to make some change there. So we we actually review the ARPAs on a weekly basis to make sure that we're moving in the right direction. Hope that makes sense. Um, and uh, how do we choose our core regions? Uh, I mean, the core regions are based off where we typically have salespeople. So our core regions right now are all in mainland Europe, uh, the UK, plus um, plus uh, the US. Um, but like we and and like that grows over time, but it's about okay, where are we getting the most interest? Where is the product best suited to? Like we also have a data team that goes in and cleans all data, um, and they in order for the, in order for our customers to see good data, so getting rid of like internet service providers and so on. Like there are some countries where they're just not a core focus. So for example, let's take for example India wouldn't be a core focus right now for us. Um, and if you were a user in India, you would probably see quite a bit of uh, internet service provider traffic, right? Um, but uh, it depends per industry and so on. But like in order to keep a bit of focus, uh, our core regions, obviously we started in Europe. Uh, the Nordics was obviously the start with the, with the biggest region then moving out across, across other countries in mainland Europe um, and in the UK. And then the US is actually probably our biggest region right now. Um, over a third of our revenue comes from the US. So I'll get to the next question now in a moment, but in terms of like the key to success, how do we like, how do we actually determine what our KPIs are and so on for our sales qualified leads? We created a model, right? Um, a very predictable model based on past performance. Okay. And this is based off conversion rates, based off how many weeks they've installed since they've installed tracker. What are the different conversion rates Our tracking script? What is the conversion rate between like a, uh, based over time and then also the convert the conversion rate from when somebody signs up to installing our tracking script and then also other influencers there like what's the conversion rate to premium to a paid customer 
over time and so on, based on the number of leads we bring in, SQLs we bring in and so on. And we, we together with our data analyst team, uh, we created a very, very like in-depth model. Now, if you don't have a data analyst team, you don't have any of this resource, it's super simple to come up with a model. My advice is always come up with the model based on some assumptions. And then as you start to get more data in, you can start to fix those assumptions based on the data that you're seeing, okay? But we've used data very, very solidly. And we're able to say very like, to not like not 100% accuracy, but in the 90s percent accuracy in terms of how, uh, how many SQLs we need to bring in in order to, pump, to pump enough revenue, right? Um, see another question come in here now. Um, let's see. What specifically has worked for you in getting your content to be ranked higher in search results uh, to drive organic traffic? And what's not worked as well? So for me personally, like I work very closely with our head of content. I think by having her on board and she comes from a background working for the search engine journal, she's got an incredibly good um, like search experience. So from an SEO perspective, having somebody on board that knows exactly what they're doing, like I'm not going to lie to you, from an SEO perspective, that's not my, my area of expertise. Like, um, But having somebody on the team that I know and trust and that she's able to, to point us in the right direction from that, um, that's been like probably the most influential thing. So hiring somebody that knows what they're doing from an SEO perspective, not just like shooting in the dark, right? And so that paired together with like very, very close work between sales and marketing has, uh, has been the reason why we've been able to be successful at this, right? So what does that actually look like? So let me introduce it, it's a bit funny now, but let me introduce it to Yakko. Yakko's our CRO, right? So like, how do I know all of these things about Yakko, right? Um, in that, you know, I, I speak to Yakko all the time. Right. So if you have a head of sales and marketing, go ask them, you know, do you know what the weight and height of your CRO or CMO is? If you have that in, within your organization. Right. But we've got a relationship whereby we're able to really deal with each other on that sort of personal level, but also at the same time, in a very like sometimes very difficult business level as well. We have to have the tough conversations, but we speak like all the time, all the time. It's very important, especially within the team that myself and Yako are seeing eye to eye and why is that, is, that, is that the case, right? What, what actually comes from myself and Yakko being so well aligned is we spoke, the, we have every single week a meeting on a Monday, which looks at the revenue from the previous week, what's in the pipeline for this week, what's coming from marketing, what isn't maybe coming from marketing, what are we missing, what are sales missing, what are marketing missing? And every single week we have that meeting without fail, every single Monday morning at half past nine. And then every single day it's, checking in with each other to make sure that the sales team have what they need. Him from the other side is being like, giving me feedback in terms of, hey, this is something that we maybe need. Or, hey, have you seen this particular number in our ARPAs? This is maybe not looking right. Like really trying to get as close together between sales and marketing as we possibly can. So what's actually being like the knock-on effect of that is that like, if we look at Johnny here, who's my head of demand gen, he's talking on a daily basis to Yesse. Yesse is our head of, uh, like a head of business development. Right. So with that, what they've managed to do is create account based marketing campaigns, which are targeting towards those outbound accounts that Yes is working on. Right. And before there wasn't any of those conversations. When I first asked Johnny, when I first joined, hey, Johnny, how often do you speak with somebody in sales? His answer was, oh, yeah, I think I spoke with him at the last like team week, which was a couple of months ago. Right. Now they're talking on a weekly basis, sometimes daily basis, and they're working together in order to target accounts that uh, Yes's team are working on. And the results of that have actually been that Yes's team, one specific example was last year, the largest account that Yes's team closed was a result of not only marketing efforts, but also sales effort. But what happened was somebody had gone very quiet from that account. And what had happened then was we started targeting that account on, on LinkedIn with those eBooks that we created before that I showed you in a couple of slides ago. Um, and what we were able to do with that was, was re like trigger the, somebody to download that ebook from that company that then gave sales a reason to pick up the phone and call, Hey, I see that you downloaded this. Can we have another chat straight away? It was, Oh yeah, I remember lead feeder came back up again. And now we we have a business need for it that needs solving. Right. And again, it's marketing touching it, but it's a step in the right direction. 
right? Again, from a content perspective, Anna's our head of content, Deepak our head of inbound. Uh, like again, Anna working with Deepak to understand which content is gonna resonate best with the, with the prospect base, right? Again, marketing from a lot of teams tend to go out and create the content all by themselves without speaking with sales first. This has been ensuring that the guys on the ground understand exactly what, the, what their prospects need and then relaying that information back to marketing and then giving the sales team something like equipment to go out with basically. Um, so like I'm after running through the last couple of slides there because I'm wary of time, but I think from, if, if you're to leave here with any key takeaways, and as I said, like I always try to give some takeaways is tracking absolutely everything you possibly can is important from the, from the beginning. If you aren't doing that already, try to build something towards where you are. Um, and from marketers, if there's any marketers here or, or founders that are working closely with marketers, just get stuff executed. Like you'll find like, you'll find in a lot of marketers that they don't have that mindset to be like, okay, let's just get stuff out the door real quick. Just make sure that it has some level of value, something tangible that people can take away from it. Doesn't need to look pretty, but the most important thing is you should get stuff out the door, right? The best marketing plans never perform, like that, that don't get released are never going to perform. So let's let's get stuff out that you know that we 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 have a tendency to think that it's gonna it's gonna perform well, but let's just get it out, right? And uh, also, like the thing that we did was focus on the things that drive revenue. So sales qualified leads plus uh, paired with with our uh, ARPAs, so our average revenue per accounts. Those two things together are core drivers towards revenue. Okay. Um, and what can you do with your sales and marketing team in order to drive that revenue? And that's it from my side. Good, good. Hey, thank you very much. Uh, you're, you're a fast talker. Um, I think we need to watch the video in slow motion to get all, right. of, uh, all of that out. Uh, we, uh, while people are still like uh, hacking away on the keyboards to put in some more Q&A, we got some questions that were submitted uh, at the registration. So, uh actually i'm going to do mine first because i think it's a good one um when you came into lead feeder uh, they they had sort of like homebrew homegrown uh, organization doing some of the um marketing you also showed that the results weren't that great because they had to try a lot of things when you came in and and uh, because it's a, it's an roi decision that they decided to invest in you and give you a budget to to make it sort of a uh, well-oiled marketing engine what did you do um, to make it better in terms of tool set, people, uh, and the ways of work? Okay. So let's start with tool set or stack. Um, there's a fancy word for it. Um, I think uh, like our, our marketing stack, I think uh, will need to improve quite a bit over time going forward. I think like uh, last year um, was a sort of, <laughs> panic stations year almost for, for a lot of businesses and, and us included as a marketing team within the org, just trying to get stuff out the door. Let's try to react. Let's try to move quickly. And with that, I, I think we're very strong in areas of data, as I mentioned before. So the stack that we're using there, so it's a mix of, of understanding uh, everything that is um, understanding that everything or tracking everything that's coming in from our different marketing channels and having that saved somewhere, which is done via our biz ops team. Then having a way to visualize that data is super important as well, right? So we do that through Tableau. That helps us make business decisions, especially for marketing. But if we're looking at from a MarTech stack, like some of the simple tools that we're using, email communications out to our lead base is active campaign, okay? Um, we're also using for product marketing, within the product we use an intercom, mm -hmm. right? Uh, for, for our webinars, which we've seen great success with, we're using Zoom. We were using a different provider and that provider wasn't able to live up to, to the expectation. So we had to get rid of it quickly, replace. Um, and uh, like from a, from a tech stack perspective, other things that could be of interest to the audience here in understanding um, like your, let's say your, 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 core target base a bit better. Tools like Built With. Mm -hmm. Built With helps you build lists of target accounts, which you as a marketing team plus your sales org can go chase. Um, something that we're using at the moment, which uh, is, is very new, but we're very happy with the results from a data perspective is Cognizant. So Cognizant, we are using for our US outbound focus. Mm -hmm. 
what we started to do is build out target lists of the companies which we want to target in the US, giving that a crossover to our outbound sales team, also populating that data with phone numbers. The phone number has been really good for the US, so direct dials. Um, and as well as that, what we've been doing is using that same data for marketing to go chase from an ABM perspective. So simply target those companies on LinkedIn with eBooks. And that's yep. worked very well. Okay. And on the organization, um, things you have to do? Organization side Actually, of things. Before we go, Andy, just to give people just one question on, uh, mm -hmm. on the ARR so that they can compare your organization to their own and the stage. What was the ARR when you came in and what is the ARR right now? So ARR when I came in was about 4.5 million, uh, maybe just a little bit below that. And we will at some point in the next months be hitting around 10 million ARR in the next, in the next half a year, let's say. Let me write that down. Uh, for <laughs> I'm saying you're after, Tipo, you're after putting me in an awkward position here with our investors. <laughs> So yeah, so so look um, for the, for that size of team, like I, it depends. It really depends on what you, what your growth perspectives are. It depends on how you want to run the business. I think at Lead Feeder we like to do things very very lean and also give ourselves as much runway as possible, which Yupa will will agree with, I guess. Um, whereas at other organizations I've been with, they've burned a lot more cash in marketing. Um, than we have done here at Lead Feeder. It, it depends on which way you want to run it. You know, it's, uh, but I feel as though Lead Feeder is, is the more sustainable way of doing it. That's, that's with my experience. Good, good. Um, and let's do maybe two more time permitting. So um, if you would have a triple budget, uh, what would you do more of? Uh, like how... Are you being held back or is there a natural speed of marketing and, and pulling more money into it isn't going to result in that much more? Or how do you see this? I think um, we're at a bit of a crossroads here. I think right now, just in terms of our growth, uh, like from a, from a, a, a people perspective. I, I believe. And I think what needs to happen there is, is we need to hire more marketing. What I'm finding is, my execution approach worked very well at around that 5 million ARR, <laughs> ARR range. But once you start going pushing towards 10 million ARR, it ends up with a lot of stuff on my desk, right? And I have to execute quite a bit myself. And I'm starting to see the tide change a little bit. So with that, like if you ask me where, I, if I had triple budget, I'd start to place more people on those teams. I start mm -hmm. hiring more, which we are working towards. Um, but I think like it depends on the model, right? If I was... If I was running an enterprise size deal size right now, rather than a volume deal size, I would say, okay, like there are plenty more touch points we can put on the customer journey in order to get up uh, to, um, to, to, to like to triple the, to triple the spend there. Right. Um, but your customer acquisition costs can be much higher in an enterprise mm -hmm. model. Right. Whereas with lead feeder as a volume model, we need to be careful that we're not, like being super uh, unprofitable with our with our spend, and as you've seen earlier on in the in the deck, you know, like it, we could very easily go up to a twenty five month payback period, which nobody really wants to have. You know, we could burn that cash, but I, I think, um, yeah, I think that's probably the best way I could could uh, describe yeah. that. Yeah, and then and then a really good one here. Um, uh, what if you have a CEO? I don't. You don't have one now, but if, uh, imagine you would, or maybe in your previous one, you have a CEO that doesn't really believe in marketing. They, they believe in sales. Marketing is just too like you know dark magic thing. So uh, how 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 do you prove it? It's an it's an R, it, it's a positive ROI suggestion. So I think it comes back down to to attribution as well, and I think it's about it's it's a mix of two things: attribution and also having sales on side. So if you can manage to Make sure that the, whoever's running the sales organization of a company in it, it's going to get tricky if the CEO is the person that's running the sales organization. Yeah. But it's about convincing them that your marketing is helping them, right? So the thing about marketing is marketing should be there to make sales lives easier. Like something I say is like marketing opens doors for sales to close them, right? 
Yeah. And the closer you get to that, the more you can prove to a CEO that it's working. But you also need to back it up with data. Most CEOs are not just going to be like, oh, yeah, I'll, I'll listen to the, you know, the pitch or whatever. They also want to be backed up by data. If you can't back it up with data, find a way that you can. And that's where you come to your attribution model. Now, if you're in a small organization and the CEO doesn't see the, the value in marketing, um, then you create a very simple single touch attribution model. You're going to only have a handful of opportunities that are being created on a monthly basis. Look into each individual opportunity and understand if marketing had anything to do with that opportunity. Yeah. And then show your head of sales. Hey, did you know that marketing did this? Mm -hmm. Or did you know that you met that person at an event and that they had a, they had a chat? Or did you know that person's clicked on one of our ads and downloaded an ebook? And the likelihood is the person that works in sales probably didn't even know that happened. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's a very good one for and uh, that was a question from Eric and I, I like it that you need to convince actually the salesperson to to vouch for you that that you're doing a good job for, to get the sales uh, you know be successful. Hey, a couple of more. So we have maybe one or two more minutes. Um, uh, how long does it take uh, you to see converted leads from your organic content efforts? So so lead time and and also mention the ticket size so they they can get some perspective of what to expect. Okay, so um, so the organic content efforts, it takes a little bit longer. Uh, the reason it takes a little bit longer is because the intent is not as high as somebody that's maybe coming direct to the site or that's been searching for a specific keyword and has landed on the site. So like if we're talking about organic content, we're talking about, let's say our webinars, our blog and all that things. Um, I think it's it's interesting though, because I have some other data which backs it up. So it can take sort of three months or so in order to get people up to the stage in which they're willing to make the next steps with you. And then remember that our sales cycles are typically 45 days. So 45 days from when somebody signs up to when they close. But um, with, the, with the, um, the companies that, are, uh, that have been interacting with our content, and we have a couple of examples of these, is that the, when they do actually sign up for a trial, they're... Uh, the, the chances of the being are converting to SQL, there's a conversion rate of about 45%. And our average is, is 37%. Mm. Okay. Now, bring that further down the funnel a little bit. The, uh, the average close of those uh, SQLs that have been interacting with our content that had this sort of multi-touch journey um, is about 35% okay? uh, on those SQLs, right? which is higher than the average as well. Mm. And then the ARPAs on those accounts that have done their homework and done their research and et cetera, et cetera, the ARPAs of those are about 40% higher as well than our average ARPA for SQLs. Nice. So it takes time. Like to give you an exact answer, how long it takes, three to six months, let's say. Mm -hmm. But the patience pays off because the other figures make sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good. Uh, I think we'll end it at this high note um uh, see your, uh, okay take one more Kai, guys and, and then we really call it a day really quick one uh please read it yourself it's uh, got some some numbers in there so you understand it correctly in your channel slide talk you have the highest co uh, conversion rate 11.1 percent by email can you elaborate this a bit more what makes it efficient versus other channels so go so I think we need to look at what the overall numbers were in that specific uh, in that specific thing as well. Like I think um, when I was so if you're talking about email being like a, our highest converting channel, um, I our email marketing like is okay now. The numbers that you're looking at from back then are like we weren't doing a huge amount of email marketing back then and that's from those results that i had in that conversion that you're taking this conversion rate from are from january of last year um so like i think the numbers uh are probably a bit misleading from a conversion rate perspective there because the number of like prospect emails that we were pushing out for marketing were much lower so i don't think that's the best like if i was to if i was to show you the sign up numbers etc uh then you would um yeah, then, then you see, okay, yeah, fair enough. Okay, so it makes sense, Kai, good. Okay, excellent. Hey, thank you very much, Andy, for this really excellent session. Um, and yeah, I mean, I guess you are reachable in, in, in ways uh, if people want to ask more questions. Um, 
I'm not going to promise for you that you will answer them, but you know, you do as you please. Uh, we have uh, the next session on on the on our SaaS camp next week on product. Um, and the previous rec uh, session was will is recorded as well, so you can come back to that one and this one. So, with that, thanks, Andy, and uh, have a great one, everybody. You too. T thank you, uh, Yupe, and uh, thanks everybody for coming. And also, if you need to, if you need any more questions, as Yupe said, please just add me on LinkedIn. Excellent. Thanks, thank you, Andy. See you. Bye -bye.